All right, A push students, let's get ready to roll here. Um, I guess we've got class number five today, and we're essentially wrapping up time period one. We're going to get into time period two history, the turning point being Jamestown. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the arrival of the English. Um, and really, one of our main topics today is going to be the proliferation of slavery, something we've been leading up to uh, for some time. Uh, and it's really going to be still uh, today, as what we're covering, uh, going to be in its early ages. Uh, we talked about the Columbian Exchange the other day, okay? So we should be good on that. We've got to know what that means. We've got to know, most importantly, perhaps, the effects of the exchange on the peoples of this continent, okay? Uh, that 85, 90% of populations uh, in certain instances in Central and South America are, are decimated. Uh, by disease with particular regard to smallpox and measles. Um, we talked about those three Gs, the motivating factors last week, and certainly uh, a lot of Europeans view the natives as savages um, who needed to be Christianized. Uh, and in the Southern hemisphere, that would largely come uh, through the Catholic church. Uh, we talked about the uh, creation of a whole race of people with the uh, mestizos and mulattoes. Um, and the exploration in the new world is off and running from the European perspective. We did talk about England's exploration the other day and that their motivating factors were slightly different. Uh, there were certainly some who came right for uh, religious freedom or to expand their church, uh, but First and foremost, the answer to the question is money. And England was here on a profit motive, on uh, economic motives. Um, they also uh, were here to fill in the void when the Spanish Empire uh, began to uh, decline upon the uh, defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588. And so that would, as we said, leave the Northern Hemisphere to other European nations like the French, and in particular, of course, uh, the the English, and uh, and it was tough sledding early on. Um, in fact, it took some time for the English to actually get a foothold in the New World. The story, of course, uh, that's most famous from this time is uh, right here in North Carolina, the lost colony of Roanoke. Uh, Sir Walter Raleigh. And um, it's a fascinating story. Um, it's probably all aliens and that's what happened to them. Uh, but what I would like you to do is take uh, a moment to type in this URL. Uh, there is no E on the end of this Roanoke. It's exactly as you see it right there. And it's going to bring you to a quick little video about the lost colony at Roanoke. And we'll move on from there. So you can pause me, uh, type that URL in, and get this video going on the Lost Colony of Roanoke. Now, the first successful English colony is Jamestown, 1607. It's important to know this is a joint stock company, okay? So it's founded by Englishmen who want to make profit. What is a joint stock company? Well, we hear the word stock. And it's not too dissimilar what we think of like a stock market, okay, uh, where we buy shares into this uh, company. The Virginia company is uh, going to establish a colony in the new world, and we invest in it. Um, it mitigates the risk for the people funding uh, these voyages. They are incredibly expensive and very high risk. And so... Uh, by mitigating the risk and kind of crowdsourcing money, um, the Virginia company is able to succeed, but it's important to note that they've got shareholders, just like a company does, that they have to answer to, okay? And so it's imperative that they make a profit. They struggle early on, again, just like the other colonies. The early years were uh, very tough. Um, they don't know the land. They have brutal winters, uh, poor for, uh, food supply. They're in Indian territory. There are conflicts. Um, but 
Nevertheless, the the colony does survive, of course, and uh, and spreads a little bit. England sends some more craftsmen, some women over uh, to encourage more settlers. They offer uh, the full rights of an Englishman and a share of self-government and a share of self-government in this new world. So that's important, too, because when we get to eventually, obviously, the, the cries for independence, some of that was kind of promised or believed to have been promised, right, by some of the early English settlers that, yes, they are English subjects, but they get to kind of strike out on their own, okay? And it's important to know who would do this. What kind of people in English society would do this? Well, probably not the top tier, probably not the people that are, you know, running English society, the no the, the lords and the nobles, right? Uh, they didn't have a need to take this kind of a chance in this new world. So, just keep that in mind of who these people are. And and, um, and when they get here, they establish uh, 1619, uh, the House of Burgesses, which notably, we're kind of on a theme here, is the first representative assembly in the Americas. There was very little guidance from England, as we'll see. And that becomes important as to how these colonies should be governed and uh, who's going to do it. And it's kind of uh, a laissez-faire approach from the mother nation uh, and uh, and with the motivations that these types of settlers had, they agreed upon democratic principles and ideas. Um, many of them may felt like they were stepping out from under the king, out from under a system that uh, kind of had its thumb on them because again, they were kind of the bottoms of society. And so they create the, some of these uh, emerging democratic principles that we'll see in this new world. Now, pausing for a minute on the facts and information, I want to talk about turning points and periodization, because as I'd mentioned before, with this successful establishment of the Jamestown colony, we come to the end of time period one in U.S. history and the beginning of time period two, time period one, 1491 to 1607. And because English influence is the single most important cultural, political, economic influence in the new world, okay, the turning point comes when the English successfully established their first colony, that's Jamestown. You see here the graphic on the screen. We have some other turning points in, uh, in in American history, okay, throughout American history. You can take a look at some of these dates, and some of these things might stand up. Uh, 1877, the Compromise of 1877, and uh, essentially the end of Reconstruction in the American South and uh, the, uh, the gateway to uh, Jim Crow era segregation, okay? 1945, uh, the end of World War II. Right. Uh, a whole entire new world order is established with that. Uh, 1980, the uh, rise of American conservatism, uh, Reaganism, if you will. So we as historians need to understand what historical events are so significant that then they change the very face of history uh, for an entire time period until some other turning point takes place. So we just want to understand that concept, okay? Now, it's a notable story of how Jamestown survives, okay? It's tobacco. Now, uh, tobacco had uh, been known about for some time. Uh, it had become very popular in England, um, even though some may have recognized it as a poisonous weed, okay? Um, but uh, an English planter, John Rolfe, uh, is kind of the savior of Jamestown um, because what he actually does is smuggles seeds from the Indies, uh, tobacco not being native to the area, but grows very well. He smuggles under the threat potentially of death, smuggles tobacco seeds from the West Indies and plants them in Jamestown. Uh, it grows great. Uh, North Carolina, Virginia, uh, we are in tobacco country, and the popularity of tobacco financially saves Jamestown. 
Uh, they are able now to have a good to uh, produce and to sell and to keep the colony afloat and expand. And in, indeed, expansion is what they need because uh, tobacco is a little bit of a unique crop. If you've ever seen a tobacco farm or tobacco plantation or what have you, um, it absolutely just kind of chews through the nutrients of the soil where it is grown. And so you need to rotate fields, even though you're growing a single crop, you need to rotate in and out and you need to plant wide, long, vast crops of tobacco. Um, and so the farming of tobacco spread further and further from Jamestown and closer to the Indians. And that's going to become important because that plays a role in some of the conflicts that they, uh, the, the, the colonists have uh, with the natives. Uh, they're driving essentially further west from Jamestown. We're talking about like that Chesapeake, Virginia area. Okay. And they're driving into Indian territory. And at the same time, there's a huge demand for labor because we are working by hand, a crop that takes up a lot of real estate. Okay. And so that's going, obviously, I think, going to become an incredibly important point. Okay. The sources of labor being indentured servitude and slavery. So what are the differences here, right? Indentured servitude would often be uh, young white Englishmen. Uh, we're talking like in their 20s. Uh, single, um, looking to make a profit, looking to establish kind of a new life in this new world. And they agree to uh, give to a, uh, a property owner a, a certain period of time that they are going to work for them a number of years. Uh, and that property only pays for their passage. Again, it's an expensive journey. So, uh, you have a plantation owner, I'd say in the Chesapeake who pays for a young man's passage to get from England to this new world. And in exchange, that young man is going to work for a set period of time for this farmer. And, and then he's going to kind of get out and be on his own and, and try to start this American dream in this new world. Um, that is the primary source of labor until about the mid 1600s, when we will see a major shift uh, to slavery becoming the dominant source of labor. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in a class or two. Uh, there's uh, a fascinating uh, vignette that tells that story of kind of what happened right there. Uh, in the meantime, the first slaves, African American labor slaves, had arrived in Virginia back in 1619. Most colonists, it is said, don't really consider them slaves, but indentured servants, but that is quickly going to change. And this is a story that we need to talk about, but I also want to show you a couple different angles on this, okay? We're going to start where this slavery kind of came from, okay, as it were in the Americas. In the Caribbean, uh, slavery was uh, very much widespread on sugarcane plantations and utilized by both the Spanish and the Portuguese. And we knew that. We talked about that before. Um, in fact, it's so predominant that 95 percent of the slaves uh, kind of post Columbus through. I would say through the turn of the, the 20th century that any slaves that had existed in that time probably went to the Caribbean or to South America. Um, but as they grew in numbers in those areas, uh, the slaveholders and government authorities uh, realized that they've kind of got a population on their hands that they need to control. And so uh, what they do is they build these huge plantations, okay? And the small farmer kind of gets out of the business. They're forced out of the business. And uh, we have these plantations, as we may think of them, with a massive amount of slaves, okay? Uh, and uh, we have slave codes put in place to codify uh, the, you know, with, with legal distinction, the status, the legal status of slavery and of the slaves. 
Here's a slave code, Barbados slave code from 1661. I want you to notice that I boldface and enlarged that type 1661 because these are the laws, okay, that get imported along with slaves from the sugar cane, cane plantations, right? These laws get imported into the United States right here about mid 1600s when this northern portion of North America, i.e. America, the colonies, begins to make its shift from indentured servitude to a more heavily slave dependent labor system. Here is the legal code, okay, that influenced early legal code in the colonies. It says, if a Negro or slave whatsoever shall offer any violence to any Christian, such Negro or slave shall be severely whipped, okay? So it makes it illegal, right, for a slave to fight back, to offer any violence, okay? Any Christian, of course, being a white man. For his second offense of that nature, he shall be severely whipped, his nose slit, and be burned in some part of his face with a hot iron. I want you to think about why that would be. Why they would burn someone on their face with a hot iron, slit their nose, or severely whip them. And hopefully you came up with the answer that they are marking that slave as trouble. Uh, it's a public shaming of that slave, and it is a badge to slave traders and slave holders uh, that this slave is uh, uppity and needs to be controlled. And being brutish slaves, they deserve not for the baseness of their condition to be tried by the legal trial of 12 men of their peers as the subjects of England are. So here they can take this beating, they can take this slitting of the nose, they can take this burning with a hot iron without a trial. Why? Because they are brutish slaves. They don't deserve trial, they don't deserve the rights of a Christian or a subject of England for the baseness of their condition, which to me speaks, right, of racism. If any Negro or further slave under punishment by his master unfortunately shall, shall suffer in life, no person whatsoever shall be liable. So if I am punishing my slave for being uppity and I kill him, eh, say la vie. So be it. Okay. These are the legal codes that are imported to Americas and establish the institution of slavery in America. Now, there's a real interesting take I want to I want to get into here. Uh, there is a social historian who's I think the chair of the Columbia University Department of History, Dr. Barbara Field, and. She talks about how a lot about how um, racism didn't really exist, uh, but was um, instituted, okay, to justify the institution of slavery. And you can read her quote here, but what she's getting to is that demand for labor okay, leads to should tell slavery. That is the buying and trading of slaves. This is very different than indentured servitude, markedly different than indentured servitude, even different than some of the slave systems that had taken place in Africa. Um, there, here we have the buying and selling of human beings, okay? And so the Portuguese kings hired writers to describe these Africans as less than human so they could justify profiting off their torture, profiting off slavery. So that racist policies of the slave trade, the racist policies of the slave trade lead to racist ideas of African inf inferiority. So it starts with the profit motive, right? Uh, we talked about this the other day. 
Now, what we're getting at here is that ultimately, though, by the time Chattel slavery of African Americans really takes hold in America in uh, the mid 1600s. Africans at this point are seen as inferior since you know since the beginning of time, as far as we're concerned in this new world, because the system that we took these slave codes from, the system that we took uh, this entire institution from, had to justify the racism against African Americans in order to support the labor system as something good for the kingdom. Um, and so in America, the African Americans are never seen, okay, uh, as equal or even human in many cases. Now, Howard Zinn gives a little bit of a different take on it, and I thought this is interesting. This is from a chapter we're going to get into next. Um, drawing the color line chapter two. And so Zinn might have a little bit of a different take, or at least maybe a different road to get to where he's going than Barbara Fields. It says some historians think those first blacks in Virginia were considered as servants. I said that earlier, right? Like the white indentured servants brought from Europe. But the strong probability is that even if they were listed as servants, a more familiar category with the English, they were viewed as being different from white servants, were treated differently and in fact, were slaves. In any case, slavery developed quickly into a regular institution into the normal labor relation of blacks to whites in the new world. With it developed that special racial feeling, whether hatred or contempt or pity or patronization that accompanied the inferior position of blacks in America for the next 350 years. That combination of inferior status and derogatory thought we call racism. So you see in that last sentence, it's that combination of inferior status, right? That we saw in the slave codes with derogatory thought that we see used to justify the slave codes and the system of slavery. Okay, so it's they, they do kind of get to the same place um, but it's interesting to consider like a chicken or the egg, what came first, slavery or racism? And the conclusion I am coming to more and more is that it wasn't racism. It was slavery and racism justifies slavery because the number one answer to every question ever asked, you got it, money, okay? Now, once this slave trade takes off, okay, um, starts in the 1500s when the Portuguese dominate uh, the trade. Um, the Dutch and the English and the French get involved. Uh, the height of the slave trade is in the 1700s. And uh, we get to this concept known as triangle trade, triangular trade, or sometimes the slave trade triangle. And you see it on the map here on your screen. So, and, and it plays into kind of what we talked about yesterday with mercantilism or the last class with mercantilism, right? That's the economic theory that colonies exist just to make the mother country wealthy. So if you look at the map, we've got lines going from North America to England, right? Plantation crops. That's the raw materials. That's uh, the, uh, the, the tobacco and, and later the cotton, okay? In England, they manufacture final goods. Uh, they sell them to Africa as well as the United States, all right? They travel to Africa, they get slaves, they travel to the Americas, they deposit the slaves, they move on, and we have this entire slave trade triangle. Now, the middle passage is what we refer to as the trip from Africa to America. Most of and using a brutish term here, but most of the cargo on board, these ships in the middle passage is slaves, okay? Um, about 11 to 15 million Africans cross the Atlantic Ocean in the slave trade, um, you know, from the total of time, right? From uh, the 1500s up until, you know, the, the turn of later centuries. And the conditions on their ships are absolutely brutal. Uh, again, we are talking profit motives. So um, the idea is to move as many slaves as possible. Um, 
The uh, slave ships would travel up and down the west coast of Africa, buying their cargo, their slaves. Um, the captives, the slaves kept in poor health. They can't fight back. Um, they are secured and chained down by leg irons. Uh, the space is so cramped that for you know weeks in this travel, they're forced to lay down or lie in each other's filth uh, or be force fed if they refuse to eat. Um, there is sickness and disease and death, and it is just generally some of the most horrid conditions that can be imagined in world history. What we have here is actually a diagram for one such ship showing how to lay out the slaves in order to maximize uh, the packing capacity on these slave trade ships. And uh, you can imagine what kind of journey this would be. And if you can't, I've got a little video aid here for you. Um, if you will now type in this shortened URL, uh, that's mid pass, but you're gonna have to type in that whole thing. I've got a couple minute video for you to consider on what it is like to um, witness uh, the, the, the middle passage, okay, mid pass. So check out that video, please, and then come back to me. Okay, that's what we got today, okay? We have wrapped up time period one. We've moved into time period two with the establishment of Jamestown. And as I said at the beginning of this lecture, we're examining uh, the proliferation of uh, conflict and slave labor in uh, the American colonies. What we are doing in class today, we have a bunch of work, all of our work, the only due date I'm paying attention to for your class is midnight tonight. Okay. So you've got probably some head puzzle videos, some uh, document analysis stuff, annotation of Zen. Perhaps there's some other stuff you missed earlier. You're going to have time to work on that when you're done with this video, which is just about now. Uh, tomorrow, we will be having a quiz in class. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. Okay. Don't sweat it too much. Uh, we're going to be a little informal on our first uh, assessment, okay? Um, but here we are. We're off and running, baby. We're off into time period two. Shut down your video and uh, get to work on what you need to work on, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. See you guys.